praise God. The, the thing that you will hear over and over again, at least from me, is that uh, what we have believed for years is God's principles are eternal and unchangeable. But he applies those principles uniquely in each situation. No two leaders are the same. No two senior leaders of a church are the same. No two churches are the same. No two churches have the same amount of leaders. Or, or no two churches have the same, same depth of, uh, of uh, mature leaders. No two churches have the same facilities. And so it's impossible biblically to apply those principles the same from one to the next to the next. And if you're trying to do that, it's not the Holy Ghost telling you to do that. It's your own flesh trying to tell you to do that. So therefore, we are not going to tell you the application of the principles that will work for you. And that's why this is so unique because you have four different perspectives. For Antioch's sake, I, I received the revelation first in 1982. And all of our initial small group ministry that we called at the time the care, care group ministry, that all originated with my, from my leadership and those that were working with me. So we've got that perspective, the historical perspective, and then you got the perspective of three separate senior ministers, all men of God, who are being led of God the way God is leading them. And as bishop, it's my job to make sure that they don't feel pressure from anybody else to do it any other way than the way God wants them to do it. And the only, way that, only place that pressure comes from is uh, when we begin to measure ourselves, compare ourselves among ourselves, and measure ourselves by ourselves, which the Bible says is not wise. Now, this approach of not only of talking about small group ministry or what anybody calls it, life groups, connect groups, whatever. I don't really care what you call it. Uh, it has gone from being, when, when I first ministered to this, in fact, I probably shouldn't tell this, but I'm really excited because the revelation God gave me is going to be the basic notes for my session tomorrow. And so there will be like <laughs> 35 plus years between me speaking from those notes. Difference. And so I, I'm anxious to see how the Lord, what the Lord says <laughs> from these scriptures now versus... 1986, the first time I used those. If you've read the book, The Missing Half of the Church, which is the first book I ever wrote, the notes from tomorrow became the outline for that book. Okay? Now, if you think they will be taught the same way today and they were 35 years ago, then you're saying that God hadn't done anything. We haven't grown any. We don't have any greater understanding than we did 35 years ago. Nah, not true. So, but the problem is, you know, people heard what we were doing and they wanted us to share it with them. Well, there was a church among us and they were, they were a big Bible study church and they had groups going and this guy uh, went to the denominal world and copied their plan, and he, he didn't just preach principle. He preached application. This is the way you do it. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is the way you do it. Well, because flesh wants all of that laid out because who wants to go to all the work of praying and seeking God and finding direction from God for yourself when somebody else theoretically has done that. And so I just backed away. 
I just shut up and said, okay, Lord, I guess they're going to have to learn the hard way that you can't just take somebody else's method and duplicate it. And what, what ended up happening? There's a lot of churches and preachers in our movement right now that don't believe in small group ministry because, quote, you ready? Here it is. You ready? It doesn't work. No, what didn't work was you taking somebody else's application of the principles and trying to duplicate them in your situation. And that doesn't work. I had, some, I had a guy tell me not too long ago, he said, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work for us. I said, I got a question. Uh, you ever had a service you might consider a bad service? Yeah. So I guess you uh, stopped having services, right? Because they don't work. I had him, and he knew I had him. He laughed and said, no, we kept having services. I said, you know the difference? You want to know the difference? You didn't keep seeking God on it because you didn't have a revelation of it. If you got a revelation, you can't try it. You don't try a revelation. That's like trying to have the Holy Ghost. It's like trying to live with the Holy Ghost. It's like trying to understand the Word of God. You, you don't try. If it's revelation, you pursue it and let the Lord talk to you and deal with you. Amen. <laughs> but that, that's the problem. And we today have some well-known churches among us who have adopted uh, some of the more modern churches in the church world and how they do it, and they're doing it like that, and they're promoting to our brethren to do it like that. Uh, someone did really nice graphics. You can't, you, oh, there, oh, you, oh, it's been changed. I walked in here, and I saw that. It said small group seminar. I said, no, it's not. You're missing the most important word. This is not a small group seminar. That lets you define it any way you want to define it. But when you put apostolic small group seminar, it means you're only going to define it one way. Whatever you see in the Bible, you let the Bible define it. And, you know... That the way that's being promoted from the church world, does that method work for the church? Yeah. When you have a small group based on watching basketball together, you have a small group based on ladies getting together doing quilting, you might even consider having a small group with those that want to pray, which is one of your smaller groups, of course. Right? Right? Well, <laughs> can you show me anything like that in the Bible? I can just see Peter. We're going to have a small group for those that want to fish. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? We'll have a small group for those that want to learn how to do carpentry. And we will connect. Yeah, that's what it's all about. It's connecting, right? But what are we connecting over? And so, <laughs> I might as well just say it from the beginning. That methodology is biblically indefensible. You're welcome to do it. Free country. God bless you. No, excuse me. I take that back. I'm not asking God to bless what he can't bless because he's not going to bless you doing it like the world does instead of the way he wants it done. So I'll say, I love you, and I'll just stop right there. I'm not trying to be unkind. This is the Apostolic Small Group Seminar, and the Holy Ghost said this to me this morning, and he said, I want you to start this seminar with this.
We are not trying to convince churches to change. You wait for the other shoe, right? I'm going to let that one sink a little bit. It's not the purpose to talk you into changing. Because what the Lord doesn't institute and instruct, you can't do anyway. This is what the Holy Ghost said. We are not trying to convince churches to change. We are trying to prepare the church to be able to change when it becomes a necessity. And it will be. That's what the Holy Ghost said. I never thought of that before, before in my life. The purpose of this seminar is not for you to go home and do something. The purpose of this seminar is to begin to prepare those that want to be prepared to know what to do when this becomes your only option again. The absolute terror and panic that was in the hearts and the lives, the minds of just the preachers that I communicated with in March of 2020 that didn't have a clue how to minister to people except in a church service. And they were terrified they were going to lose everything, lose everybody they had, terrified. I believe in the move of God. But so many of our churches don't know the difference between a move of God and people's emotions being hyped. And you can hype people's emotions and call it God when everybody's live. But let me tell you something. That same hype, when streamed, looks stupid. And you know it's the truth. The stuff we've learned to do in our church services to get people going so we can convince ourselves we've had a move of God. If it doesn't work streamed, it's not God when it's in person. Because God's not limited. He can speak to a donkey. He can speak to a burning bush. He can't speak to a screen. Somebody needs to be listening because God's talking to you. And we've used that excuse. This is what the Holy Ghost said to me back in April of 2020. He said, any kind of ministry you can't, you have to have a building to do and you can't do outside of a building, it's not apostolic. It's not apostolic. And I'm not, I've never preached against having a church building. I've never preached against having services. But if we're dependent upon having a building to do what we call ministry, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. And so, (laughs) I really am glad that the hundreds, the great number that I'm talking to, I can't see their faces right now. (laughs) Because watching yours is enough. (laughs) Would you reach over to the person next to you and just get their mouths closed for them? Uh Help them out. (laughs) And and I can hear it right now. I can't believe he's saying all that. Well, it's nice to be ministering to you for the first time. (laughs) Because if this is not your first time, you don't have any problem believing I'm saying all this. Because I'm going to say what God gives me to say exactly how he tells me to say it. 
It won't be pretty. It won't be flowery. But you won't leave here wondering what I was trying to say. Or better yet, what God was trying to say. So, I'm going to say it one more time when we get going here. I have a few things written down just to kind of have some idea. I believe he gave it to me, but I'm not bound to any of this, okay? One more time. The purpose of this apostolic small group seminar is not to try to convince you to change. The purpose is to prepare you to be able to change when you don't have any other choice. I mean, seriously. I'm not going to get into any of this, but really, have you followed at all what the Dodgers are doing? Hello? What they're doing? First, there was the outcry, and so they canceled what they were doing. In less than 24 hours, they got so much heat from the other group, they reinstituted it. And, and the, what I read today is they're not willing to even talk about removing that. And I read also where there was a, a, a relief pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays that, that shared a video of a man, a Christian, quote, unquote, say, calling on people to boycott Target. And they, they made a big deal over his retraction and his apology. What? He apologized for sending that out. What? And you think... We're just going to be able to rock along like we always have? You think that? If you think that, you're not praying because, because the Holy Ghost is talking to anybody to listen. In fact, the problem is what's got me so urgently involved in writing as much as I can is because I don't think this is really going to start in its more overt efforts against the church in years from now. I think it's more a matter of Possibly months, in some places weeks. So you're, you're trying to get us afraid. Oh, no. I'm trying to get you to do something by faith. Hebrews eleven seven, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his household. Faith in God's word. He had he was he was moved by faith in what God said of things that had not been seen before. Things not seen as yet. He believed God when God talked about things that had never been seen. But he believed God. Not what his experience was. Not what he had heard before. I don't mean to be offensive here, but I don't believe there's one person in this room that honestly saw in advance being quarantined, not being able to leave your house, not being able to go to work. I mean, e even... Three months before that, it would have been unthinkable. I'll tell you how unthinkable it was. <laughs> I was in Brazil in February. I got home on a Saturday morning. 
Sunday evening, I flew to St. Louis for the midwinter general board meeting. And when I got back, it was the weekend of March that was the last weekend of church services. <laughs> now, I, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying this. I knew something was going on, but I didn't have a clue what. I felt something happening, but I know what. Lord didn't tell me. And he doesn't tell us everything. He didn't tell Noah everything. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things, what? Not seen. If you've got a see to believe, too late. Too late. I know good men, good men, men that I love, that essentially lost every bit of congregation they had. Many churches ended up with less than half of what they had before COVID. Some less than that. Why? They weren't prepared. They didn't know what to do. The whole focus of their ministry was church buildings and church services. And again, it's not that that's wrong. But they didn't have anything else they could do when that wasn't an option. You know what? This is not being streamed. It's only being made available by Zoom. Now, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do, whether we're going to put it on YouTube or just make it available for those who want to sign in and watch it. <laughs> you know, why is a serpent harmless as a dove, right? But, <laughs> oh my. <sighs> they, they already are thinking it. But nobody among them are have yet taken their thumb out of the dike. They've already concluded that the Bible is full of hate speech. But they haven't taken a stand on it yet. It's coming. The point of time is coming. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you say. You don't have to stand in the pulpit and say anything. You don't have to stream anything anybody's watched. You don't have to tweet anything that they get, gets them upset. <coughs> One question. Do you believe the Bible? Second question. Do you believe everything in the Bible? Guilty. That makes you guilty. You're a person that's full of hate. Period. In a story. What are we going to do then? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of churches that are going to deny that they believe the Bible is literally true. Even some that would say right now that they do. But when push comes to shove... And they're potentially going to lose everything they've got. And they're going to be absolutely vilified. And actually, people endorsing, physically accosting them. I mean, okay. So this person goes into that Christian school in Tennessee. Shoots those kids. And whose fault was it? Hello? Wasn't that person's. That person was an innocent victim of the way 
we treated them. It was innocent. It was justified. There was so much hate and anger there for the way they were treated. And that's why Jesus said, they'll actually believe, believe that they're doing God a service by taking you out. It's in the book, if you believe it. So, that's enough of that. Let's, uh, I think I've got your attention. So, let's go into this. And uh, I'm only doing this at his instruction. There's two types of crises coming. And they're both coming. I'm going to tell you about the good crises that's still a crisis. Apostolic increase is a crisis. September the 12th, 1970, my 19-year-old wife came with me as a 24-year-old green preacher. Green, meaning very inexperienced. So inexperienced, I had no idea how inexperienced I was. She was raised in a pastor's home with a mother who was an evangelist. She traveled all summer, every summer during her growing up with her mother evangelizing all summer. And so they, nine months a year, she was, she was at the, her dad's church. And by 12, she was the, key musician and the and the choir leader in a in a home missions work and uh i mean she had all that experience i was raised by a mother in the church and by a dad who didn't get saved until he got saved here so my dad was not saved i didn't have any of that experience and so we come here at the direction of the Lord, and that's putting it mildly, because I did not want to do that. Uh, I spent four, four very lonely, painful years down here. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to come back. No offense to y'all from here, but I didn't want to come back. I didn't leave anything here but painful memories, and I didn't want to come back and visit them. But he was very determined, and since I want to go to heaven, I didn't have any choice but come, so we did. There was no people here to collect up of our faith at all. There was no way to start, traditionally, where you go in and get you a building and put a sign out and hope you probably got some crowd of at least some disgruntles that'll come for a while. So I'm serious. Yeah. I mean, we, you're looking for church hoppers that will come in and hop for a while just so you got somebody to preach to. I've said this many times, but you know how difficult it is on a marriage when you're preaching to your wife and you can't deny you're not picking on her? I mean, just having anybody there to blame that on helps your marriage. And, and some of you know this story, but my mother was attending United Pentecostal Church when I was born. I was born about five months after the UPCI was formed in September of 45. I was born in February of 46. And I didn't know anything else but the United Pentecostal Church. And I was very indoctrinated in our ways and never questioned them. I never questioned church. And the way to reach the world is invite people to church so they can get saved. And I didn't question my pastors or my mother or anybody else on that. That's what we did. That's the way we did it. That's what I did. Now, we got married in 1st of November 68 and the latter part of December 
this little home mission church we were attending right outside of the Naval Air Station in Pensacola. Uh, I've never been a part of this. I've never done this. He did it. God bless him. He was the pastor. He had a right to do whatever he wanted to, I guess. But every, at the end of every year, they'd get together, and they would elect who was going to be <laughs> Sunday school superintendent, who was going to be the ladies' minister, who was whatever. You got the picture? And here I am, 22, and I get elected by this group of 30-plus people to be their Sunday school superintendent. Okay, being raised in the church, I'd never knock one door in my life till late fall of 1967. If you're doing the numbers, that's only a little over a year before this. I'd never, I'd never attended the church and preached witnessing. No, inviting people to church, which is not witnessing, of course. You know, they, they, they preach to us, to encourage us to bring people to church, invite people to church. But nobody preached witnessing, and there sure was no door knocking going on that I was aware of. And I attended everything. I participated in all of it. So here I did never even knock a door in my life till fall of 1967. And in December of 68, I am now elected Sunday school superintendent who also is responsible for visitation. And so, the pastor's working a full-time job. The church is going to grow. Guess whose responsibility it was? Mine. Well, I'm in prayer. And I just kind of felt like if... If we could get kids to come to church, then that would be an open door to witness to their parents. And maybe we could see somebody saved like that. I didn't know anybody was doing that. I honestly knew about it, nobody in the world doing that. It's just what I felt to do. And it worked. In about seven months' time, the Lord doubled that church. through visitation and bus ministry. Now, he didn't double the church. He doubled the crowd because the crowd's not the church. But I saw it work. So I'm, I'm ready to go now. Okay, we're going to start this church. We're going to do two things. We're going to get a building, have services, and invite people to church. Well, there was only two people to do that, her and I. And somehow, she ended up pregnant. You know how difficult it is to take a pregnant woman on visitation with you? Now, we, it, she did get us in a few doors. Seriously. There's a couple of places. This one lady who became a real friend. She never got saved, but she was really kind to us. She said, girl, what are you doing out here like that? Get in here. And I'm going, all things to all men. Yes, ma'am. Here we go. Yeah. Now, there is many different ways to grow a church. That's one of them. Uh, David was born on the 2nd of November, not the day after we were married, but a couple of years after we were married. We were married on the 1st of November. He was born on the 2nd of November. That's his joke. I just took it that away. He, we were married on the 1st of November of 68. He was born November the 2nd, 71. Count it up. Okay, so he was our first new member. We, we didn't have any new members till, at that point. We had some people coming. And uh, we did have a breakthrough two months after that. And prayed uh, 11 people through in the December of 69 and baptized uh, nine and two of those are brother and sister Libby, R.E. Libby. Some of you know them. And so things started happening. And uh, by the middle of 
73, we had a core group of about 30 to sometimes as many as 50 who were willing to do visitation, drive a bus, pick up the kids, get them in a building, teach them, get them back on the bus, and take them home. And after the first of the year of 74, we had a committed group of about 50 who did visitation, drove the bus, picked up the kids, brought them to a big high school we rented, take them in the building, teach them for an hour, put them back on the bus, take them home, and then they'd go do that all over again. We had two separate bus routes, two separate times of teaching. So it, God blessed it to such a point that by April of 74, we had a record attendance of 648 in less than four years. Now, Brother I, you did a great job. No, I didn't. <laughs> All those folks who were doing the visitation, every Sunday morning by 6 a.m., they're up getting ready to get, get on the bus and go pick up the first group. And, they, and, and, and those folks weren't getting home till 1, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. And guess what? We had church on Sunday night. Oh, that's not all. We also had church on Saturday night, and we had church on Thursday night for the first 13 years. That was our regular services. Why? Because if the way to see people saved is to have church and invite them to church, you don't do that once a week. Not if you believe it. And that's all I knew, so I believed it. So we started when there was two of us. We started with Thursday night. Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. So these precious folks that were getting up and getting ready to run the buses and pick people up and do that twice, pick the same people that did the visitation did the pickup and take home. They were the same people that did the teaching in the classroom, and they did that twice a Sunday morning. What a, what a group of people that was. Wow. 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 I'm still in awe of them. Still in awe of them. And we did it like that for about two years, I think it was. But I'm standing on the steps of the high school watching the buses unload. And I'm young and just absolutely eat up with zeal, which didn't exactly make me really balanced as a person. In fact, if I would have believed then what I believe now, and if I would have had some elder that I was submitted to, there are things he would have never agreed to me doing, but I'm standing there, and I'm watching these people stream in this building. And he says to me, Pastor, I don't know if he ever call, he's ever called me that before since. Pastor, you know you must give an account for these people. You're pretty happy with the fact that we were, we were running 450 in, the, in that crowd. That, that was a normal Sunday for us. Even on the Saturdays, we didn't get to do any visitation. We were running 450. And he said, Pastor, if I came right now, how many of these people would go? You've got to give an account for them. How many? And I went, oh, Jesus. I've been so focused on getting them in, I haven't focused on grounding and growing them. So what was my answer? Shut it all down. With no forewarning. You talk about no wisdom. He didn't tell me to do that. It's just that he challenged me. I, 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 I got to be able to teach these people and get them ready for heaven. 
Well, the problem is the same people need to be taught were the ones doing all this work. And by this time, they were pretty much tired, you might say. So the only folks that we had were those who continued to come on their own. And what was amazing to me, that group was... Uh, with us doing no visitation, just having church on Sunday morning, we, we were running about 250, 270. I look back on that. That, that blows my mind from, from looking here, from here back there. That, that blows my mind. I, <laughs> I was pretty thankful for that. And we had this little building. It was nothing but an auditorium. And the buses we owned that we were running to pick up kids with twice on Sunday, we looped them in this driveway around the building. And the people that did come, that was our Sunday school classes because we didn't have any other way to do it. During the wintertime, we'd run extension cords out to the buses, put electric heaters in them so we could teach them. Because the problem was, the laborers were awesome, but they, they were laborers in a method. There weren't a lot of people getting the Holy Ghost. Well, we had people getting the Holy Ghost, but not, there wasn't a lot. Not like you would think. And so, in the middle of 76 or somewhere around there, I just began to really focus on teaching people. Growing laborers. Spiritual laborers. And focusing on we've got a harvest coming. We've got to be ready to labor in this field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in September of 79... We started a new work out of our church in a town about an hour south of here. And uh, it was about 30 adults and their kids that uh, went started that new church. So the Sunday night crowd that had been running maybe 160 to 180 at times was now down to... Uh, about 125 faithful men, women, and children the first of the year, 1980. And uh, people started getting a Holy Ghost without, without a method, without a program, without working a method, just praying and witnessing and inviting people to church. Uh, it's, I've never seen anything like this, but in starting the first part of January of 1980, for the next two months, if you got to Sunday morning late, if you got to Sunday morning service on time, you were probably sitting on the platform because there was no room left for you. No exaggeration. That little building was absolutely crammed. People started getting the Holy Ghost. In uh, January, February, we had about 30 receive the Holy Ghost. So we started a revival on March the 13th, 1980. We went 11 weeks, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, Sunday morning, Sunday night. 11 weeks, five nights a week. And that same spirit of work was there. That, in fact, the Lord had said to us in November of 79, uh, and it's the verse in, I think it's Jeremiah, your work shall be rewarded. And work they did. And uh, in that revival, that 11-week revival, we prayed through 405 and baptized 397. And I knew in the early part of this, I'm going, oh, ain't nobody going to believe this. So therefore, 
I'm baptizing. Every, we'd already, I'd already trained people, and there were others baptizing. But I knew I had to do all. I wanted to do all the baptizing because I wanted to be able to look somebody in the eye and say, "I know it happened." We moved out of that little building into the YMCA when we started that revival. Every service, every service, you talk about a spirit to work. Every service, they gave us a little room to store our stuff in. <laughs> Took one of those buses, drove up to a wholesaler in Philadelphia before we started that revival. We didn't have any chairs. And the YMCA didn't have any. And we bought 900 metal folding chairs wholesale. Fill that bus up with chairs. And chair trucks to put them on. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mark, you were there. <laughs> See, I know there's people here that were there. So if I'm not telling the story right, uh, they'll know. Brother Richard Bishop and Sister Jane Bishop were there. Who else was there? Anybody else in here tonight? Yes, ma'am. There you all are. And so every service, we had a, an altar built. It was about 20 feet long. Bought some carpet for the altar area to set the, 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 uh, the, the altar bench on. We bought some folded foldable portable platforms. We bought some chair trucks for the organ. We never took them off the organ. We had these handles pulled down. When the handles came down, the wheels went down. You could wheel that organ back into storage. You pull it out. You pull the, wheel, the arms up. The wheels came up and it sat there. Brought the Leslie out. Hooked all that up. So we, we set up the portable platform. Rolled the carpet out. Put the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the altar on the carpet. Put the piece of carpet on the platform. Put the pulpit on the platform. Set the drums up. And set the organ up. And set 900 chairs up every service. And took it down every service except one. And that's, that's, I, 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 think, I think they let us leave it up Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. I think, yeah. So we had to set it up before Thursday night. And take it down before Friday night and take it down. But then after Saturday night, we didn't have to. And Sunday morning, we didn't have to. But Sunday night, we had to. So. <laughs> and these people would show up an hour before service. Be ready to go get this thing all set up. And the problem we had in those services, we had so many people in the altar, there wasn't enough trained people to, to pray for them. In my personal opinion, the number of people that could have gotten the Holy Ghost in those 11 weeks could have easily been 50% more. We just didn't have the people. We started with 125 committed men, women, and children on Sunday nights. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so when, some, when, they, when I'm doing the baptizing, we're in the basement. We went out and bought a horse trough. Yama and I steal horse trough, put it in the basement. They let us put it down there, fill it with water. And we had robes. We bought robes. And so we had teams of people that would help people to get changed, bring them out to be baptized, take them back to get changed. And then people had to put on wet robes because there was too many to be baptized. And so if they brought somebody to me and said they got the Holy Ghost, I didn't say this to anybody, but I made up my mind. You got the Holy Ghost? You're not getting out of this water till I hear you speak in tongues. And most of the time it didn't take long. But then every once in a while, they'd bring me somebody who hadn't gotten the Holy Ghost yet. They got in the water. Well, didn't always have to stay in there long. But rarely did they get out of the water without getting the Holy Ghost. So those numbers, 397 baptized, 405 filled with the Holy Ghost. 
I know those numbers are real numbers. This is no evangelistic number. Well, the adversary didn't like that. So out of the clear blue, the city decides to inspect the YMCA. They found lead in the insulation. And without any warning, they shut us down. We had no place to go. We found a high school auditorium down the southern, toward the south in the county. And we had no way to contact the people that were coming regular. We had, we had names and addresses, but we didn't have computers. We had people that were trying to contact them. We were trying to follow up. But in 1980, this little home missions church prayed through 551 people. When you say that's exciting, it was, it's, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was surreal. It was, in my years in Pentecost, it was, I'd never seen anything like it. Well, then, the Lord showed us a uh, warehouse in Severna Park, 10,000 square feet, that uh, I went down, knocked on the door, of, technically, of the county executive and said, Sir, we're the fastest growing church in this county, and there's no place left for us to go. And at that time, it was against zoning regulations for churches to use commercial space. And I said, there's a warehouse in Severna Park that the owners are willing for us to use. But I need your permission and your assistance with all of the inspectors to get this done. I look back on that. I didn't know how much of a miracle that was. He called a meeting with the head of every department of the county in that building. And he looked at him and said, we're going to help this church. And he went to the fire, the fire guy, the electrical guy, the, you name the plumber, and said, okay, what do they have to do to get, uh, to get in here as quickly as possible? And each one of those guys were squirming. They said, well, if they'd at least do this or that or whatever. He said, Okay. Reverend, can you get that done? I said, sir, that'll be done in less than two weeks. He looked at me like, right. He didn't know this group of people. Are you kidding me? We were done in less than two weeks and had the permit moved in. And about two months later, Brother Keith Clark came, and we had seven weeks of revival. And prayed through 200 and, I think it was 252, I think. According to him, before he passed, that was the largest single revival he ever preached in his life. And then we kept having revival. And then that fall, Richard Hurd came for nine weeks. And we prayed over 600 through. And for the year of 1981... 1,034 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Fifteen hundred and eighty-five people, five fifty-one and nine and in eighty, a thousand and thirty-four in eighty-one. Fifteen hundred. What did I say? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Fifteen eighty-five. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It wasn't because of my leadership. It was because of these folks. They worked. Worked. Here was the problem. By the time we broke for Christmas, the plan was for us to take two weeks off for the holidays. And Brother Hurd came back, come back. We were, we were exhausted. And, uh, and, of course, if you know anything about his style back then, whoo, he made me act like, like I was Mary Poppins or something. So he was brutal. If you were supposed to be saved and he saw your eyes, he'd rebuke you from the pulpit. You're not here to listen to this message. You're here to pray. And then you can pray with people in the altar. 
Other than that, this isn't for you. Quit acting like it is. He didn't do that once. He did that at every service anybody would peek. Now, if that had been the first revival we had, instead of the third, we might have been able to have lasted longer. But when he left and this sense of relief came, and I'm not blaming that on him, we were exhausted. So, <laughs> we, I, I called him and said, Brother Hurd, I'm very sorry, but uh, I, I, we can't go on. Please forgive us. Well, here's the problem. This thing is going now. We prayed over 250 through in 82 doing nothing but having church. And nobody preaching basically but the pastor. But the problem was, the only way I, the only way I knew to, to take care of this harvest was to have church services. And the only thing we did different when the revival, from when the revival is we dropped Friday night service. Because we'd been having Thursday night, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday night all this time. Because what, what I did in most of those services would teach. Even when I was, people considered it preaching, it was teaching. So I would teach, 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 teach. Well, that's all I knew to do. And the only thing else about discipleship. Well, the problem was, I had this vision. I saw my hands like this. And I saw this stream of wheat pouring down in my hands like, a, like you'd see somebody pouring sand in the, in the hands. And I saw that there was more as mu almost as much falling out of my hands as there was falling into my hands. Because my hands could only hold so much. And when I woke up from that dream, I knew exactly what the Lord was saying. My hands were the church services. And we had maxed out the ability of traditional church structure to handle a major apostolic revival. And the Lord said to me, your structure cannot contain what your faith has produced. Now, I don't mean to be offensive here. I'm just a green kid. I, I turned 30 in February of 76. Just, I had no experience. All the experience I had was there. Learning by trial and error, trying to walk with God, trying to listen to God, studying the Word. But I, I didn't realize how clouded my mind was by tradition. So I'm trying to make something work that wasn't the way the early church did it. You can take this, do with it anything you want. If you still think that structure and method can handle an end time harvest, then you've never had much of one. Because you hear me right now. We had a revival and a harvest that produced a crisis. It produced a crisis. Let me tell you what. People think they're under all kind of stress because nothing's happening. You haven't understood stress till it is happening. You don't, you don't understand pressure till it is happening. And the only thing that the people want to ask you, I wasn't, I wasn't telling this. I wasn't telling this. In fact, the superintendent that I loved very, very much in 1980, he had heard some bad stuff about the guy that was the evangelist at the Week revival. I found out he essentially told the preachers in our district not to come. We didn't pray one person through from another church in 1980. 
But they'd all heard Richard Hurd. Some came when Brother Clark was there. Others came when Brother Hurd was there. And, yeah, some of those people were from other churches, and I'm happy. But they played through it, prayed through in our building. Wasn't claiming them. I'm just saying those 1,585 people prayed through in our building, in our services. I, I hope, oh, you don't know how much I hope, that there was a good percentage of them that went someplace else and they took care of them. I'll tell you something else. At that time, there were about 22 apostolic, if you want to count that very loosely, as people that believed in baptism in Jesus' name and Holy Ghost, one God. Some of them, not much else. Um, in fact, probably in 1981, easily 50% of everyone that received the Holy Ghost that year were African Americans. And the community put major pressure on them not to stay. And uh, so... Those 22 churches, within a matter of a year or so, were anywhere from 10 to 90% full of people that prayed through at Antioch. Some of them still have those kind of percentages. I'm happy about that if they're going to heaven. I'm happy about that because our structure couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle it. Will you hear me? Either the Lord is a liar. Or every truly apostolic child of God and church is going to experience revival and harvest. It's going to put you in crisis unless you've prepared. So, it's like uh, April of 82, and I am so distraught. I'm depressed. How do you pray through all those people and get depressed? Because it wasn't about the numbers. It was about the souls. And I knew we just were not taking care of them. And I was doing everything I knew to do. I was doing everything I was taught to do. And it wasn't working. And I'm, I had a, our bed had a shelf here, and I had a couple of books there. And, and this particular Monday morning, I, I didn't feel like getting up at all. I didn't want to get up. Tried to go back to sleep, couldn't. I was too distressed. And I was kind of twisted around and looked at these little books. I had a little small book that was about John Wesley. And I'd never really read anything about John Wesley, so I pulled it down and started reading. <laughs> it changed my life. It opened a door. I read about Wesley and how he'd been an Anglican priest that had actually been an Anglican missionary in Georgia, the, the, the colony of Georgia. And then he went back to he was called back to England, and uh, he was an Anglican priest. And there was a group called the Moravians in Germany who believed in apostolic concepts. And they, they used these apostolic concepts by meeting in homes, ministering in homes. And on Aldersgate Street in London, in a home group meeting conducted by the uh, Moravians, John Wesley testified that his heart was strangely warmed and he began to preach from that point in time that you couldn't be saved without having a supernatural experience of conversion. That's all he could describe it as. I'm not wasting your time. You've got to get this. And the problem was, he, this lit a fire in him. And he began to move outside of Anglican doctrine, preaching from Anglican pulpits that you had to have a conversion experience or you weren't, weren't saved. 
a supernatural experience. Well, he kind of began to follow the Moravian's pattern and start having people that wanted to hear what he had to say, collect, collecting them up in homes. And he spent the week going around to these homes teaching this stuff, preaching to them. Well, he had so many converts, and it was just him, that the, some of the early ones that were he had been invested the most in, he put them over the, uh, the home groups. He called those nurture cells, according to this little book. Well, they kept it, they just, the growth of them just kept exploding. So he began to collect, collect these groups up on Sundays in what he called religious societies. He's an Anglican priest. He can't call it a church. And he picked those that had grown the most spiritually and put them over those churches that cost him. Because the Anglican uh, officials called him in and said, stop this right now. You cannot use uneducated, unsanctioned by the church people to minister to these people in these homes and in these churches. No, they're religious societies. No, no. It's either do that or leave the Anglican priesthood. Well, he left the Anglican priesthood. And because he had a very rigid approach to all of this, his detractors started calling him a Methodist. And I'm looking at this, and I'm, boy, this, 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 this nurture cells in these homes and, and these religious societies led by non-professionals that had a relationship with God. And I went to the book. I have started studying the book and seeing if there was anything scriptural about that. And not only was it, was there something scriptural, this was the exact pattern that the early church used, the exact pattern. Well, here I am at this time, 1982, I would have been uh, seven, 34, no, 36. I would have just turned 36 at this time. And... Uh, I never heard this in my whole life, and I've been a faithful, loyal member of the United Pentecostal Church my entire life. And I never heard this from anybody. And the Lord said to me, this is my pattern for being able to handle any size harvest that I produce. Because there's no limit on this. All you have to do is focus on training the people, growing the people, and I'll grow the body. Well, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I didn't have anybody I felt comfortable talking to, calling, and I'm, I, and I'm in the bookstore, the Christian bookstore, and this, I had this wild thought. I, I'd, I'd never heard anything like, like this in my life. I didn't know anybody, anybody, any church in the UPC or out of it that was using anything similar to what, what I saw in the Scripture. But I'm in a Christian bookstore and I'm thinking, the thought just came, I wonder if there's any books written on any of this. <laughs> I'm walking down the aisles looking... And I walk around the end of this aisle. You know how they put small shelves at the end where you could, whatever. That shelf about this wide, about five shelves deep, every book on that shelf was about small group ministry under different names. I looked at that and got angry. Here are these Trinitarians. They were blasting. And while all we're doing is regurgitating Acts 2.38 and oneness of God all over again, which I believe in with my whole being, but you don't grow people feeding them milk. And, and, and basic foundational doctrine is milk. You feed the babies. And we got whole congregations, they've never had anything but milk. And while we're doing that, 
Here are these people that we're, we all, we're depreciating and devaluing that they've already settled the salvation issue in their mind, whether it's true or not. And they, they go to the book and find this structure that belongs to the apostolic church. Well, I was young and stupid and angry. I felt let down. I felt, I felt let down. Because I'd given my whole life to this. And what was worse, when I finally did have a few people I could talk to, without me knowing it, they went and talked to others. Next thing I know, I'm starting to hear that right is a charismatic. Because I'm teaching what is in the book pr practiced by the apostles that made me charismatic. Well, all I had to do was wait long enough for us to finally. Come out of our stupor, and today, you don't find anybody that says having small groups, however, whatever you call them, is charismatic. In fact, the statement is there's no growing church that's not doing some form of small group ministry. Really? Well, if the devil can't keep you from doing that, what he wants you to do is do it like the world does it instead of the book. What's what is so mysterious about going to the Bible and letting the Bible tell you how to do what's in the Bible? Why is that so hard to comprehend? I know. I'll tell you why. Because that's work. And the shortcut is let's just copy somebody else that seems to be working for. It depends on what you define as working. Because I don't define growing a crowd as growing people. And a church that is growing biblically is growing because they're focused on growing people in God, growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've had some people say, Well, what's your evangelistic outreach? <laughs> Uh, our evangelistic outreach is uh, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. But he can't send laborers into the harvest who have not grown into being laborers. So the biblical way of having a harvest is not to go out and just send people that don't know what they're doing out to reap the harvest. It's to prepare people to be laborers in the harvest. You don't grow churches. You grow people. You grow people. You grow laborers. You'll have growth. Some sow, some water. God gives the increase. I, I understand. I really get it after all these years, 55 years in the ministry. I get that this is not popular and it's not comfortable. Okay. So the Lord began to put all this together and by the first part of January of 83, we launched at the Lord's specific direction, the Care Fellowship Ministry. It was just small group ministry. That was That's a generic name. You can call it whatever you want. It's what we call it. It's what the Lord gave me. Now, none of the three congregations are using that name now. Well, they're, they're wrong. No, that's the name the Lord gave me. They have the authority to use whatever name God gives them for what they're doing in the church, the congregation they're responsible for. The only thing that matters to me is the principle. Are they following biblical principle? Now, <laughs> one more time. 
until you have a revelation of a concept that can handle what your faith produces. Not, God's not going to birth babies for you to leave on somebody else's doorstep to take care of because all you want is numbers you can shout over and not take any accountability for those that are being saved. Now, if it's pride to tell what I've experienced, then forgive me, pray for me. The primary crisis we had was the crisis of people, the number of people to take care of, and the crisis of trying to pay for what it, you do traditionally to take care of them. You got to build bigger buildings have bigger church services to be able to take care of all these people. Well, by the time we started building, the first time we ever had a building program, we started in June of 82. We had literally over 200 Bible studies a week being taught when the building program started. I did not have the faith to pay a contractor and his crew to do all that. So we built it all trying to save money. It took a year and a half before it was done. And, by the, and the people that were teaching all those 200 Bible studies were the ones showing up three, four, five nights a week and all day Saturday. So by the time we moved in this building and had the dedication, we had two Bible studies going. And so this building, because, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Every time we went to a conference, they didn't want to talk about the people getting the Holy Ghost. We had one question. We were, we were asked this one question over and over again. Have you built a building yet? Because without building a building, Nothing that God was doing was valid in our culture. Nothing. They didn't want to talk about the number of people getting the Holy Ghost. In fact, only one question they'd ask about that, how many did you keep? Because if they could prove that we didn't keep every single one of them, then they must not have gotten the Holy Ghost. And that's, of course, because they don't know what the Bible says. But that was the pressure, build a building. So all these devoted, committed people that had seen such major revival, their efforts were wasted building a building so that we would finally have some credibility with traditionalists. And God took half that building away on February the 18th, 2003. And every time we tried to build it back, he shut that down. Do whatever you want to with that. It doesn't matter to me. I know what I know when I know what I know. I'm thankful for this building and this beautiful four-year-plus meeting area that we're, we're building out here. I'm happy for it. It's going to look nice, and I'm happy for that. I'm happy about that. But this building is not going to give us revival and harvest. It's not going to happen. Paul went to Rome in chains, of course. And they knew he was different, so they cut him some slack. They didn't put him in prison. They let him rent a house in Rome, and they just put somebody there to keep him, to basically guard him. But they let anybody that wanted to come to that house come, and Paul could minister to them. 
And he did this for two whole years. But this is what, before we got at the end of chapter 28 of Acts, Paul first gets there, and as his pattern was, he always went to the Jews in any city he first went to. And uh, you, you can, well, I'll, I'll let them put this on the screen. This is Acts chapter 28, and I'm going to start with verse 20. After, after he went to them, this is, what, uh, this is what he said, Acts 28, 20. For this cause, therefore, I have called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. They had no basis for having any negative feelings about him, but this is what they said. 22. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, the Christians, we know that everywhere, everywhere it is spoken against. Not thought negatively of. That's not what they said. Everywhere it is spoken against. There's no place you can go, Paul, that you're not going to face different degrees of hostility because nobody thinks well of this thing you're involved in. (laughs) Do you honestly think... That that day is not coming here in these last days of the church. You honestly think that. Are you really honestly telling yourself that the world's going to love us? Uh Uh-uh. Jesus tells us not to love the world. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. You're not better than your master. So if you're trying to win the world's approval, you're choosing not to have God's approval. Because he's not going to allow both to happen. He's not going to allow both to happen. Now, (laughs) Brother Andrew Urshan from Persia comes to the United States, gets the Holy Ghost, gets a revelation of baptism in Jesus' name, one God. He goes back to Persia, Iran, preaches to family and friends there, prays a bunch of them through. On his way back from the States, he goes through Russia, preaches in many different places in Russia, baptizes a bunch of those people. They get the Holy Ghost. He comes home. And when the Iron Curtain came down, And we were able to go into Russia some 60 years later or so. We found Urshanites all over the place. When they were locking up Christians, when they were martyring Christians all over the place, somehow the truth managed not only to survive but thrive. In fact, it is estimated in some circles that there are more one God baptized in Jesus' name apostolics, if we're going to use that as the criteria, in Russia than there is in the United States. And they had no freedom in which to have church. And we had freedom, no persecution for being Christians all these years. And we use the public method of church service and invite people to services and haven't had near the growth they had with no freedom and the risk of being put in jail or even executed. And if that wasn't enough to get our attention, after World War II, the communists took over China. And over the last 10 to 15 years, 
people have gone into China with this message and found people in house churches, small groups all over China by the tens and hundreds of thousands. When the Chinese have been even more brutal against Christians than the Russians were. Would you please tell me how? Is it that the Russians and the Chinese are more spiritual than us? Is it they love God more than us? Or is it the difference in the methods that they use versus our methods? I haven't been to China, been to Singapore, been to Hong Kong, not China, been to Japan, been to Korea, <laughs> been to Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, I said that already, Philippines, not China. But I know people that have gone into China that have told how many people there are. I don't know how they know how many people there are because they don't really make one another vulnerable to being able to betray everybody. In fact, what they do to be able to have a computer in a projector just so they can teach or whatever is they take the computer and the projector apart and give all these different parts out to people so that if anybody is arrested, they've got a useless part of a computer or a projector. And when they come back for the next gathering, they reassemble it. And they're reaching people by the tens of thousands. Oh, and I don't, I don't know what their doctrine is, but I know this. It is currently reported that the fastest growing church of any faith in the world is in Iran. You can't hardly find a more hostile environment than that. And it's mostly made up of ladies. And some of the latest reports are this is now happening in Afghanistan. You can't have much more hostile environment to all of this than that. But this is what they say. We wait for God to give somebody a dream. And he directs us to them and we witness to them and they get saved. Or they will approach us or the Lord will lead us to them. We just don't witness to people indiscriminately. And people are getting saved to whatever degree of faith they have. Now, I'm not saying, you know, don't judge anything for the time. I can't put them in heaven. You can't put them in hell yet. If God's brought them all this far, give him the chance to bring them the rest away, okay? The bottom line, the point I'm making here is this. It doesn't matter exactly what your doctrine is. If you're a Christian... That's a executable offense. In Iran, the number of Christians that have been executed in uh, Afghanistan, Iran. Especially Afghanistan, after the Americans pulled out, there was nobody left to protect them. It's a staggering number. And yet people are getting saved to whatever degree of faith they've got. And you know what? The Holy Ghost comes to guide us into all truth. So let's give God and the Holy Ghost a chance. <sighs> okay? But how are they doing this? 
They're not meeting publicly. Are you kidding? They're not meeting publicly. They're meeting in houses, in closely guarded locations. They don't bring anybody into till that person becomes a convert and the Lord bears witness with them that this person has been converted to faith in Lord Jesus Christ. You would think that with the freedom we've had, we'd never be able to build buildings big enough to hold everybody. But the fact is, and the cold hard facts are, it's just the opposite. Because like everybody else, there have been many times I've focused on the church service and having to move a God. Hearing a word, speaking a word, having prayer meetings. Oh, that's good. But it doesn't sow seed. I believe in prayer. I don't think I have to defend that. But prayer doesn't sow seed. Prayer, you can pray all you want. You can pray 24 hours a day. And that doesn't replace sowing seed. He didn't say go into all the world and pray. He said go into all the world and sow seed, preach the gospel to every creature. <laughs> so I'm asking this question. It won't be the first time I've asked this. But how many doors within a one-mile circumference of your front door have not been knocked on at all by anybody from, from your church? Because we're not risk, at risk of anything, just somebody mocking us. Not yet. And we're so protective of, our, of us not being mocked that our problem is we don't talk to anybody except that those that are safe to talk to. And the guys that are passionate to stand on the street corner, we kind of make fun of them just like the world does. And the guys that stand outside Planned Parenthood, like the guy that got beat, beat up the other day. We go, why is he doing that? He was just praying. He was praying. Now, I'm... I see the runway. It's a ways off, but I see it. I'm asking you a question. We love God. We, uh, we pray. We worship. We believe truth. With 8 billion people going to hell, are we really being blessed if Two get the Holy Ghost, five get the Holy Ghost, ten get the Holy Ghost. Is that really the blessing of God? I know the scripture says rejoice with the, even just one sinner that repents. I get that, okay? But the bottom line is this. <laughs> with eight billion people going to hell, I don't know any churches that are being blessed with the blessing of Abraham. I don't know any. Because the bottom line is right now, the people that we're praying through are not even converts to our church. They're only potential laborers for the harvest. So in that context, I'll, I'll, worship with, I'll thank God with you for the one, for the two, the five, the ten. Unless you're counting that your harvest. Now, if you're counting that as God trusting you with these to be lab to be trained to be laborers in the coming harvest, that's that's what I rejoice over. But if we're not training them, we're just collecting them up so we can count them and tout how big we're getting, <laughs> which is 
so sad that it's, that it's not even funny. I have a question. <laughs> oh, Lord. Why don't we ask ourselves the question? Why God is not blessing us what he blessed the early church with. Historically, there were over 250 million people in the known Roman world. Because they did censuses. They knew how many people there were because they knew that because they collected taxes from them. That's how they paid for their empire and for their wars. They knew. And... Several historians have said that as many as 10% of all Roman citizens became Christians. And there was only one kind of Christian to become. Baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, one God Christians. 25 million? Not using the new word we use, constituent, which is anybody that walks by on the street out there and looks our way, we count them. Or at least we're encouraged to. That's really not an exaggeration in my opinion. But these are people, these were people that put their life on the line to follow the teachings of the apostles. 25 million. And it, 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 that's, not, that's not us touting that. That's what the historians say. Well, if God is not blessing us, there ought to be a question we ask. Wait a minute. Okay. God's faithful. He's faithful. If he's not blessing us like that, what could the problem be? Could it be that he won't bless us doing what we're doing Lest we're convinced what we're doing is what he said for us to do. So what if the way to have his blessings is to go back to the book and find out how he did it and do that? Of course, the problem is, you see, if we're having good church, we don't want anybody to say we're not being blessed. Because as long as our, you ready? Are you ready? Ooh, Lord. As long as our numbers are increasing in attendance, our crowd, and as long as our income is increasing, we consider gain godliness, don't we? That's how we define godliness is gain. Gain in numbers and, and attenders, not church members. You understand that attenders are not the same thing as church members. You understand that church members are a long way from biblical disciples. And oh, and by the way, I'd like for you to show me in the Bible where anyone can be saved who's not a disciple. So that rules out church attenders and that rules out church members. Biblically. Because we're not following the book. We preach Acts 2. Yeah, I know you preach Acts 2 38. You know what it means when we preach Acts 2 38 over and over again? It means we acknowledge we're feed, still feeding milk to babies who have been around forever. They haven't grown up enough to need meat. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11, chapter 5, 11 through 6, 3. You know what? Pastor used to be hard. You had to discern where people were. Not anymore. There's people sitting here. I've been shocked at the stuff you advertised on Facebook. I'm going, whoa. I guess uh, the last three years will reveal what's really in your heart. Huh. 
Why? Because the disciple doesn't change because a disciple doesn't change just because you can't get together with people so they don't know what you're doing. Well, that used to be the way it was. <laughs> you could kind of get away with living stuff outside of church as long as you kept your mouth shut. But that's not the way it is anymore. So you look at Facebook, not anymore than I can help it because it's too discouraging. People I thought were a whole lot more mature and committed than that. Or not. Well, you're just talking about the outside. Nah. Because biblically, what's on the outside is a reflection of what's on the inside. That's the biblical principle, you see. Well, I don't believe the outside matters, then. You don't believe in speaking in tongues, do you? Because we can't see the Holy Ghost. So there has to be an external evidence. So if I believe that the way we know that people have received the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues, then I can't say the outside doesn't matter because the outside also communicates my commitment or lack thereof. bottom line is it doesn't matter what your pastor says or doesn't say you can't do Jesus is the one that defined what a disciple is and so much of the stuff that people are struggling with it's not what they're struggling with is the issue it's that it proves he doesn't own them and to be a disciple the Greek is if any man will come after him, me, let him deny himself. The Greek is to renounce ownership of yourself. So if you don't own you, it doesn't matter what you like or don't like or want or don't want. It's what he likes or doesn't like. It's what he wants or doesn't want. But people that won't even give him that opportunity to tell them how he feels because they're so caught up in what they think and feel, that's fine. But it just proves you're not a disciple, which also proves... That you're not saved. Because he's only going to save disciples. So the saved number is a whole lot smaller than the crowd reported numbers. And why is that the case? Okay, here we go. Ready? The Bible calls us a building. The Bible calls us a temple. You know anything about building? You know anything? You think it's Anybody goes out to build without a blueprint? Is there a blueprint? Absolutely. It's called logos. The word of God is the blueprint. And the owner of the building is the architect. And the owner and the architect are the general contractor. The owner, architect, and the general contractor is the foreman. We're the laborers. We don't have the authority to change the blueprint. The only question is, am I going to follow the blueprint or not follow the blueprint? And building like our fathers built, without checking to see if our fathers followed the blueprint exactly, doesn't fly with Jesus. That's what got him crucified. In fact, he wouldn't let the Pharisees and the other Devoted Jews, he wouldn't let them off the hook because they weren't following the blueprint. Now, used to, years ago, it, that blueprint and getting your permit to build is just a formality. Once you started building, you just build it however you wanted to. And you might, you might even, a lot of times, the inspector would just come out and clear it as an as-built. Then they got a little more strict, uh, got a little stricter, and they 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 re- required you to uh, <laughs> blow up, draw up new plans to show how you built it, and then they would approve it as as built. 
That doesn't fly anymore. You don't make changes without them seeing it drawn up and approving of it first or you're in trouble. Well, if man is going to be that much of a stickler, you think it's okay with God if you change his plans to fit the way you want it built? So uh, if we could, uh, you could help me out. We're going to go quickly here because I'm really trying to not quit after everybody else has and we're winding down with how far they can go. So here's the blueprint. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Verse 18 says, uh, All of power, the Greek word's authority, in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And that word teach in the Greek doesn't mean share information or pass along knowledge. It means to work the process that makes people disciples. Look it up. The word specifically is a commandment to make people disciples into disciples through teaching and training what he taught. Well, what are we supposed to teach? Okay, hang on. <laughs> Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word is nations like the U.S. and Canada. That word nation in the Greek is much broader than that. Peoples, kindreds, tongues, families, nations, whatever. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, verse 20, teaching them... To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end. Okay? That word teach in the Greek, at the beginning of verse 20, is a separate, a different Greek word. It is the content of what we teach people to make them disciples. And what is that? Everything, everything I taught you is what you're to teach them. I have a question, please. Do we believe the apostles disobeyed Jesus? Okay. If we don't believe the apostles disobeyed Jesus, then everything they did, every method they used, everything they practiced, came from whom? Right. So did they do that? The first 41 verses of Acts chapter 2 all speak of things that went on on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.42 is the first verse that gives us a clue of what the New Testament church was like. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking bread and in prayers. And they did that according to verse Acts 2.46. They did it publicly and from house to house. And in Acts 5.42, they did that in every house. And when Saul, who later after his conversion became Paul, wanted to per persecute the church in Acts 8.3, where he found them was... In every, he, he, he found him in the houses. When he wanted to persecute the church, he went to the houses to find him. So the abundance of verses for basing a ministry, at least significantly, on the house portion of it, is far easier to prove than meeting in buildings like this. And you understand, I... I'm on the board of trustees. In fact, I'm the chair of the board of trustees. This didn't get built without my involvement and agreement. So if I'm preaching against this, then I'm contradicting myself. That's not the point. I'm standing for the part of the book we don't do. So the Holy Ghost was first poured out in a house. The first outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the Gentiles was in a house. Saul, who later became Paul, received the Holy Ghost in Ananias' house.
Paul's ministry in Corinth was in Justice's house. On his way to Jerusalem, when he met with the elders at Ephesus for the last time, Paul declared that he ministered publicly and from house to house. And then, of course, the last recorded venue of Paul's menu ministry is the last couple of verses of Acts 28. And there's no amen at the end of Acts 28, which has been preached about many times. He did not minister outside of the house. But everybody that was that wanted to come could come, and he ministered to them in the house. The implication is that's kind of what he did every day, all day. Well, you know, Brother Wright, I just don't like... I had a preacher's wife say to me, just within the last six months, I just don't want people bringing their spirits into my house with their, with my kids and all of that. Ooh, I was kind as I knew how to be or could be. But I said, so it's okay to encourage your people to have people in their house. But you don't want them in your house. And I said, uh, the Bible says we're not our own with bought with a price. Whose house is this? Because this, if this house is yours, then you're not his. Period. No, point blank, Period. If it's your house, then you're not his. Because if you're his, it's his house. And hear me, please. The day will come. that it will be very difficult for anybody who doesn't cave in to this world's agenda to have any kind of public, what we call public church service in the good old USA and it's already happening in Canada. If you're not paying attention to what's going on in Canada, <laughs> you're living in denial. And excuse the very corny joke, but denial is not a river in Egypt. Hey, do any of us want to hear this? I don't know about you. I don't want to be saying it. But I got to obey God. I've got to obey God. So I'll go back to the beginning as I'm closing. Whatever that means. We're not trying to convince churches to change. We're trying to prepare the church to be able to change when it becomes an absolute necessity. And according to the Lord, it will. Now, when is the easiest time to change? When you're not under pressure? And like Noah, you've got an opportunity to prepare even though you don't see Coming to pass what we've heard, what the Bible says. Is that not the easiest time to get ready to prepare? Because if you don't, we're going to find ourselves in even worse shape than we did in March of 2020. When preachers and churches are going to be absolutely in terror. Because what do we do now? Oh, and by the way... <laughs> Oh, I don't even want to say this considering the amount of time I've spent recording stuff. But if you think they're going to shut us down from having church services and let us still continue to stream live services and use YouTube, have they made marijuana legal in Maryland yet? 
because I'm looking for some kind of excuse why you would think that. Because if you believe that, you've got to be on something. It's okay that you laugh, but I'm serious. You think they're going to shut us down for believing hate and let us continue to use the internet to preach? Not happening. And those that are ready, shoes the double or triple negative are not only not going to miss a beat, but those that are ready are going to be able to be prepared to take full advantage of the fact this world's going to be in chaos. People are going to be full of fear. Because all of that, for all of that to happen, let me tell you what, it, there's a whole lot of other stuff's going to be happening, like people aren't going to be able to get food easily. There's not going to be gasoline, even if they're letting us still sell it. People are going to be in dire straits. They're going to be looking for help. And you're going to have to be able to be led of the Spirit to not talk to anybody except the one the Lord sends you to, lest they betray you. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We're starting in the morning and Friday and Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Again, tomorrow morning and Friday uh, and Friday morning is uh, teaching sessions. I'm teaching in the morning. Pastor Joel is teaching Friday morning tomorrow. Excuse me, tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Pastor Wright, David Wright, is ministering here. And on Friday night, Pastor Carl Simpson is ministering here. And uh, <laughs> Jesus, help us. Father, there's some in here that reverence you and believe your word because it's true. There's others in here that are have opened themselves up to the spirit of fear that's not from you. And they're in terror right now and don't appreciate any of these things being said because of their terror. But, Father, whatever you've got to do to get our attention, whatever you've got to do to get us in alignment with you so you can use us to reach the, the truly hungry that, are, that want to be saved in this world, do it, Lord. You've already given your all from a natural perspective to save the lost. Don't let the body of Christ hold back like you didn't hold back. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Some of you say, are you saying the mark of the beast is coming? No, there can't be a beast. Can't be a mark of the beast till there's first a beast. And the mark of the, the and the and the beast can't the antichrist can't be revealed until after the church is caught away. But do you think this world's going to go from zero to sixty in a blink of an eye? The world's already going to be conditioned to accept all of this, and this conditioning is taking place even while the church is still here. In Jesus' name, I love all of you. It is 9.08. That was a very long two hours, wasn't it? I don't mean that unkindly. There was no breathing room in it. It was all heavy. I love you. I'd love to fellowship with each one of you. But can I ask you, please, get your stuff together 
especially if you're coming back in the morning and tomorrow night and Friday, Friday morning and Saturday and also Friday night. Get your stuff together. Go. Okay? Go If you got to get something to eat, get something, take it to your room or get, eat at the house. But go home, get something to eat, get some rest. Jesus' name.